In the last few videos, we've been looking at the underdamped response of second order systems. What we want to consider here is how does that response change as we add additional poles? So it's worth noting that the equations from the previous few videos are only for systems with two complex poles and no zeros. So what we're going to address in this video is what happens if we have more than those two complex poles. And in a later video, we're going to come back and talk about what happens if we add zeros to the system as well. So as I said, we're going to say, what if our system has more than two poles? And if we're talking about under damped response, then they're going to be complex poles. So it has more than the two poles. So at the moment, we'd say, well, this doesn't match our criteria needed that we talked about in our previous video, so we can't use those equations. But what we're going to see is in certain cases, we can approximate it such that the equations are good enough. So in certain cases, we can approximate the system as a second order system. second order. And so when we do that, so of course, if we had a system with three poles, we would say it's a third order system. But if we're approximating it as a second order system, we'd say it only has two dominant poles. So two, and if we're talking about underdamped, then they're going to be complex. But the main terminology here is that they're going to be dominant poles. Now, you kind of have an inkling of what what that means uh, without getting into the details of it. Of course, they're sort of dominating the response. They're dictating what's happening. But let's take a closer look at what that means and what type of criteria we need to meet in order for these approximations to be good. So let's look at a general system with two complex poles and one real pole. So we're going to consider a general system. And that general system has two complex poles, which is sort of what we were already considering before. But now we're going to add in one real pole as well. And so let's go ahead and sketch out what this looks like on our S plane. Always good to keep in mind what's going on graphically in our S plane. Uh, as we'll see later, this is a handy tool to be able to use. So this is our S plane with our real and complex axes. So let's say we have our complex poles P1 and P2 here, and then we have some real pole P3 on the real axis. So this is P1, P2, and P3, okay? And so based on our equations before, we know that that pole one and two are going to be given by negative zeta omega n plus or minus j omega n square root of one minus zeta squared. We talked about alternative forms where we have our omega sub d and our sigma d. Uh, either way you want to talk about it is fine. And then our pole three is just going to be negative alpha sub r, where alpha sub r is just going to be the distance uh, from the origin on that real axis. Okay, so it turns out if we have that configuration, and we put a step input to the system, we're going to have some output in the frequency domain, C of s equals a divided by s, so that's going to come from our input, plus, now from our two complex poles, we're going to have b times s plus sigma omega n plus c times omega d. And in the denominator of that, we have s plus sigma omega n squared, plus omega d squared. And then from our real pole, we'll have d over s plus alpha r. And so this is shown after doing sort of expanding that with partial fraction expansion. And so what we would want to do is solve for a, b, c, and d. Uh, we're not really going to focus on that process too much. But let's just say if we do the inverse Laplace transform, the general form that we would get is C of T is equal to A plus E to the minus zeta omega N T. And then we'll have some sinusoidal terms, B cosine omega DT plus C sine omega DT. 
and then we have plus d e to the minus alpha r t. And so an important thing to note is that this last term here is the component based on our real pole. So a component from our real pole and over here we have the component, let me make sure I get my exponential in there. This is the component from our complex poles. Okay, so again, we've kept everything really general. Notice we've not put any specific numbers for our alpha r, for our zeta, our mega n, any of that. So this is just the general form. So of course the idea is if this third term is small enough compared to this term, then hey, we can approximate this as a second order system. So in general, we can say that the larger that alpha one term is, so larger, sorry, not alpha one, alpha sub r, so larger alpha r means less effect of real pole on the system. Well, so to be complete, let's say the transient response of the system. And so of course we could consider the extreme case. Again, I'm just looking at this exponential term here. If our alpha r goes to infinity, of course we'd have zero because we could rewrite this e to the negative alpha r t as one over e to the alpha r t. So as that alpha r t becomes really large, that number is going towards zero. And so as that becomes more and more negligible, um, our, our approximation that this is a second order system becomes more accurate. So one thing to notice relating this back to our S plane is that this larger alpha r corresponds to uh, for being further left in our S plane. So it corresponds to being further left. And so all that means is if this pole is further left, we're gonna have a better approximation. So we don't want it to be too close to P1 and P2. We want it to be as far away as possible in terms of moving left. Okay, so the obvious question in is how far does it have to be? So how far does P3 need to be? And let's go ahead and say to approximate our system as second order. And the answer, which is very vague and probably not very helpful as well, it depends. What does it depend on? Well, how much accuracy do you need for a system? Um, if it's something that requires a lot of accuracy and you're wanting to model as a second order system, then that alpha r should be very, very far to the left. If it's something where you're maybe just doing some initial calculations to get a rough idea, then maybe you don't need it to be too far. Um, so let's go ahead and look at sort of a, a, a good sort of middle ground point where we can say, yeah, this is a pretty good assumption for a second order approximation. But keep in mind, it does depend. In some cases, you want it to be more accurate. In some cases, you can relax this a little bit. So, Let's keep in mind that after five time constants, that a signal has decayed to less than 1% of its original value. So an exponential decaying signal has decreased, so I said less than 1%, so to be a little more accurate, we can say decreased to about 0.7% of initial value. And of course, we can say that about 0.7% of the initial value is essentially zero in most cases. So because of this, a common approximation is to say, well, if that alpha r, that real pole, is greater than five times the real part of our complex poles, which is zeta omega n, then we can approximate it as a second order system. So we can say this, if this is true, then second order approximation is okay.
So in other words, sort of putting it into words rather than just this equation, looking at our S-plane is we're saying that P3 needs to be five times farther to the right than farther to the left, excuse me. So P3 five times farther left than P1 and P2 to approximate a second order. So if that condition is met, and again, keep in mind it depends. Sometimes you might need to be more stringent if you require a lot of accuracy. So maybe in some cases you might change this to 10. Maybe you're being a little looser for that first run through to just get an idea. So maybe this can be three or something smaller. But in general, we're gonna say this is our common approximation that that real pole has to be five times farther to the left. Once we approximate this as a second order system, all of the equations that we looked at previously apply. So we can then use our percent overshoot, our peak time, our settling time. We can use the data in that table for our rise time. So all of these equations then apply once we use that second order system.